Our reading continues this morning from Luke's Gospel, chapter 9, verses 28 through 45. Uh, reading today from the Common English Bible translation. Uh, you can follow along, if you wish, uh, from the insert that is provided for you in your bulletin. About eight days after Jesus said these things, he took Peter, John, and James and went up on the mountain to pray. As he was praying, the appearance of his face changed, and his clothes flashed white like lightning. Two men, Moses and Elijah, were talking with him. They were clothed with heavenly splendor and spoke about Jesus' departure, which he would achieve in Jerusalem. Peter and those with him were almost overcome by sleep, but they managed to stay awake and saw his glory, as well as the two men with him. As the two men were about to leave Jesus, Peter said to him, Master, it is good that we are here. We should construct three shrines, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. But he did not know what he was saying. Peter was still speaking when a cloud overshadowed them. As they entered the cloud, they were overcome with awe. Then a voice from the cloud said, This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. Even as the voice spoke, Jesus was found alone. They were speechless and at the time told no one what they had seen. The next day when Jesus, Peter, John, and James had come down from the mountain, a large crowd met Jesus. A man from the crowd shouted, Teacher, I beg you to take a look at my son, my only child. Look, a spirit seizes him, and without any warning, he screams. It shakes him and causes him to foam at the mouth. It tortures him and rarely leaves him alone. I begged your disciples to throw it out, but they could not. Jesus answered, you faithless and crooked generation, how long will I be with you and put up with you? Bring your son here. While he was coming, the demon threw him down and shook him violently. Jesus spoke harshly to the unclean spirit, healed the child, and gave him back to his father. Everyone was overwhelmed by God's greatness. While everyone was marveling at everything he was doing, Jesus said to his disciples, Take these words to heart. The Son of Man is about to be delivered into human hands. They did not understand this statement. Its meaning was hidden from them, so they could not grasp it, and they were afraid to ask Jesus about it. Let us pray. Spirit of the living God, reveal your word to us this day that we might have life in your name. Amen. A reporter interviewed Ukrainian citizens in Kyiv on the day following the strikes by the Russian Federation. Opinions were mixed much as you would expect in the midst of such a traumatic experience. Anxieties were high, and fears about the future permeated their conversations. A pediatrician who was an administrator of a NICU in a prominent hospital said he promised his family, his wife, and children that he would protect them. He said that his youngest daughter believed that he would. Then he wept openly because he knew that his word alone would not be enough to ensure their safety. Another man waited at the bus stop, overhearing a young voice from the crowd shouting, there are no tickets, what are we going to do now? When asked where he was going, the man said that his family owned a villa in Italy where they would go until the war ended and then return. It is unclear whether he ever crossed the border into Poland. Later that same day, the reporter spoke to an elderly woman who owned a bakery, and even on this day, she woke up early 
and kneaded countless loaves of bread for her neighbors, like always. The reporter asked if she planned to leave Ukraine, and the woman said, I have no other place to leave to. My home is here. I am here. And she said this knowing that within just a few short hours, the here that she had come to call home would never be the same again. For this unnamed woman, here had become a place of familiarity, of intimacy and belonging. Here was a place that she recognized, sight, sound, smell, and touch, but also a place by which she too had come to know herself. Here was the place that she knew and also the place that had come to know her. Sight, sound, smell, and touch comforted by her presence and by her tears. The sound of her laughing and the many people who gratefully received all that she made with her own hands. Here can be a place that we learn to depend on. And here is also a place that is ever bound to change and to change us. A here that we come to know and love can become a here that we no longer recognize. Like a foreign land in which we, feeling far from home, find ourselves asking the question, where am I? It is precisely because here can only exist in the present moment that it is rife both with paradox and possibilities, and a familiarity that has the potential to vanish into strangeness right before our eyes. Because here is a door that opens in all directions, toward the past and toward the future, birth and suffering, life and death, promise and despair. To be here entails the constant movement into newness. And much like a river, our feet, even when they do not move, never remain in quite the same place as they did before. As Peter watched the appearance of Jesus' face become as lightning and the presence of Moses and Elijah talking with him, he said to Jesus, Master, it is good that we're here. As if to say, let's not go anywhere just yet. Let's just stay here for a while. The gospel writer wants us to know that here is a moment that Peter wanted to sustain and to preserve. The scriptures then tell us that Peter did not know what he was saying. This brief added detail helps us to focus in today's reading, helping us to gain a better sense of what the gospel writer wants us to know about what it means both for the disciples and for us to be here with Jesus. When reading Luke's account of the transfiguration, it is tempting to immediately turn our attention to uh, his description of the sights and sounds from the vantage point of the disciples' experience. The appearance of Jesus' face changing, his clothes becoming white as lightning, two men from heaven, the prophets Moses and Elijah, talking with Jesus. And then these words, Peter and those with him were almost overcome by sleep, but they managed to stay awake, and they saw his glory, a word that denotes beauty and splendor and light. But let's turn our attention for a moment to the fact that Jesus brought the disciples, Peter, James, and John, up on the mountain so that they could pray. And it is in prayer that this moment occurs, a discernment of the location of the presence of the divine. Scriptures say that Moses and Elijah were talking with Jesus about his exodus, a word that means departure, which the gospel writer also adds Jesus will carry out in Jerusalem. The exodus of Jesus is his death, which means that when the disciples see the glory of Jesus, what they are witnessing is none other than the glory of his impending crucifixion. 
The glory of the transfiguration is primarily a sign of Jesus' acceptance of his death at the hands of others. Why is this important? It is important because, as you know, Jesus' death has not yet occurred in the gospel story. So Peter's comment about staying here comes into full focus. Peter assumes that what he sees has already been fully accomplished, but if Peter's advice had been heeded, if in fact they had stayed upon the mountain, there would be no cross. And thus the glory that Peter sees would not be brought to its completion. But of course, as you heard, Jesus and the disciples do not remain upon the mountain. No, as Peter is speaking, the light of this divine encounter turns into shadow and a dark cloud covers them, and they find themselves inside of the cloud, and they hear a voice that says, This is my son, my beloved. Listen to him. And suddenly Jesus is alone with the disciples, and as they come down from the mountain, the disciples tell no one what they have seen. But the next day, Jesus and the disciples find themselves surrounded by a large crowd, And a man, weighed down with desperation, cries out for Jesus to heal his only child who is suffering. And the father goes on to describe in detail the heaviness of his burden and the helplessness that he feels as he seeks to do all that he can to care for his son. You can almost hear his voice, the sound of him having tried everything. It is the sound of having nowhere else to turn. And the fact that, and in fact, the Father tells Jesus, I begged your disciples to cast it out, but they couldn't. Could it be that these are the same disciples that were just up on the mountain with Jesus? Hear also these words from the opening verses of Luke chapter 9. Then Jesus called the twelve together and gave them power and authority over all demons, and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. Except that in today's reading, these same disciples are unable to do what Jesus clearly gave them authority to do. Thus he turns to his disciples and says, You unbelieving and misled generation." How long will I be with you and put up with you? And then he turns again to the father and he says, bring your son here. And there's that word again, here. And the healing and healing the boy, Jesus gave him back to his father. And the scriptures say that everyone was overwhelmed by God's greatness. But again, if Peter's advice had been heeded the previous day, if Jesus and the disciples had stayed upon the mountain, there would be no healing for this family. Meanwhile, Jesus turned again to his disciples and says to them, take these words to heart. I love uh, the Pew Bible version, the New Revised Standard Version says, let these words sink into your ears. The Son of Man is about to be delivered into human hands. In today's reading from chapter 9 of Luke's gospel, we have the transfiguration in which the disciples see the glory of Jesus visibly. But it is a glory that they fail to see is also intrinsically linked with the suffering of his cross. And then we also have a story about the healing of a young boy and the restoration of an entire family back to their community. And again, at this very moment, when everyone is overwhelmed by the experience of the greatness of God, Jesus brings to the attention of his disciples that God's own chosen and beloved is preparing to be arrested and undergo the harshness of suffering on their behalf. But the disciples do not understand the nature of the glory they have witnessed on the mountain, nor are they fully ready to lean into the healing authority that Jesus himself has already given them. Thus, they do not understand why he is telling them 
that his own life will be given over unto death, nor are they fully able to recognize and to imagine that it will be given back to him. What is it that they do not see about Jesus, their teacher? What they do not yet see is the truth of who he is and the character of his ministry that he has called for them to follow. Even though Jesus' crucifixion occurs at a particular moment in time, its meaning is not isolated, but is rather a revelation of the nature and character of God in every moment always. And the response of the divine to the cumulative suffering of the whole of creation. The groaning of those who cry out into the silence of the night. The tears of parents for their children. The burdens of those who cannot find their way home again. The terror of those who hate themselves. The shame of those who tell no one. The fear of those without food or shelter, the heaviness of those who do not earn a living wage, the stress of those who care at the bedside, the desperation of a people whose very lives and culture are endangered, the plague of violence and bloodshed and war, and the ongoing destruction of land and sea in the name of profit. What Christ reveals for us in these two stories today is that they are in fact one story of the God who came to live among us in history, bearing witness to the revelation that the earth has indeed become the site of the glory of the divine, a glory that is not confined to a mountaintop somewhere, but is present wherever God's people gather and are hurting not restrained for a select few to experience, but as visible and as public as a cross on the outskirts of the city, or a woman who dares to get up early to bake some bread for her neighbors as her heart is breaking and her whole life is crumbling around her feet. It is here for all to see and feel and touch a life that is meant for us to share together, a life that bears witness to the sights, sounds, smells, and touch of the glory of our God. Because the human hands that come to arrest Jesus are not the only hands in this reading. Jesus has hands too. Hands that reach out to heal and to touch the lives of those around him. And here in this moment, Christ's hands are our hands. And so here we are. Here, in this moment now, with all of its fear and incompleteness and uncertainty and hope, and as the whole earth suffers the compounded weight of grief that we have borne in recent years and in these days, we are not alone, for our God is with us here in this neighborhood, here in this city, here wherever God's children live and sleep and suffer, here to redeem us, here to restore us, here to befriend us, here to stay with us, here also to send us, here to go before us, here with love that does not end, but is a power that goes out from our hands to touch and to heal a hurting world until he comes. Amen.